please turn in your Bibles to the book of Exodus chapter 17. Exodus 17 and place a marker in Isaiah chapter 40. Today I'm going to be reading from the New International Version. And for those who are taking notes, the title of today's message is Finding Strength. I have a question for you today. Have you ever been tired? Yesterday, Christina and I went out and we took my dog, Ben, for a hike. And we went out to Hobbs State Park. There's a trail out there called the Pigeon Roost Trail. Has anyone ever been on the Pigeon Roost Trail? It's a lot of fun. It's, I will say it's a better hike when the trees aren't all bare. It was, wasn't a lot of scenery yesterday. But it, this trail is listed in the brochure as being moderate to strenuous and I am here to testify today to that fact there were times while I where I felt like you know what this is a moderate trail and there were times where it was strenuous it's not a big hill but I think that my app told me that the overall elevation that we climbed was around 600 feet I am pretty wrecked today so if I hobble around up here, you'll have to forgive me. But that trail, the Pigeon Roost Trail, has two loops. There's a short loop that is about four and a half miles. And then there is a longer loop that is almost double that. Well, yesterday we decided to take the short loop. And I am so glad that we did. Because by the time we got done... I didn't want to take another step, and I don't think Ben did either. I'll tell you, when you get up to the trailhead, they do something kind of sneaky. There's three or four little switchbacks, and you can see the truck. The truck's up ahead, and you're exhausted, and you're like, I just want to go there, and you have to turn and walk away from it. Ben kept pulling, saying, no, I want to go this way. I said, believe me, buddy, I do too. I was exhausted. I didn't want to take another step. I was spent. And here's the sad thing. This is not the first time that that particular trail has nearly killed me. There was a time, I believe it was Courtney's senior year, when we as a family went out there on a Saturday afternoon. We got there shortly after lunch sometime afternoon, and at 6 p.m. we had a band banquet to be at. So we're like, you know what, let's just take the short loop. It'll take us a couple of hours, and then we'll have time to go get showers, get cleaned up, and get to the band banquet. That was a good plan. But unfortunately, as anyone who's been on it knows, that trail is not well marked at all. And we took a turn that we shouldn't have that sent us on the long loop. Eight and a half miles later, I can tell you there was not one person who was in a good mood. We were exhausted and we were grouchy. There was one point where I seriously thought about just lying down on the ground and saying, that's it, send a helicopter, I'm done. And after all this, I still like hiking. I was tired and I was exhausted. I remember that day I was hurting in places I never realized one could hurt. But today I wonder if there's anyone who feels like that. Not necessarily physically. But I wonder if there's anyone here who is just emotionally spent. You were doing fine. Things were going well. But then you faced some hills in life that just seemed too much to climb. If you were to describe your life over the past several months or years, you would describe it as being moderate to strenuous. 
nothing easy about it, and you're just tired. If that's you, I don't want you to lift your hand, but I want you to know that this word today is for you. Today I want us to look at an event that is found in the book of Exodus chapter 17. This account occurs right after God sends water from a rock for the Israelites and right before he gives the Ten Commandments to Moses at Mount Sinai. It takes place in a place called Rephidim. I want us to read it together, Exodus chapter 17. We're going to start in verse 8 where it says the Amalekites came and attacked the Israelites at Rephidim. Moses said to Joshua, choose some of our men and go out to fight the Amalekites. Tomorrow I will stand on top of the hill with the staff of God in my hands. So Joshua fought the Amalekites as Moses had ordered. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went to the top of the hill. As long as Moses held up his hands, the Israelites were winning. But whenever he lowered his hands, the Amalekites were winning. When Moses' hands grew tired, they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. Aaron and Hur held his hands up, one on one side, one on the other, so that his hands remained steady till sunset. Verse 13 says, so Joshua overcame the Amalekite army with the sword. So in this story, the Amalekites attack the nation of Israel in the wilderness. And Moses tells Joshua, get some of our men and go defeat them. He says, I'm going to go up on this hill and I'm going to intercede for you. I'm going to go before the Lord and I'm going to hold my hands up and I'm going to Root you on. Moses notices that whenever his hands are raised, the Israelites are winning. But whenever he starts to lower them, they start to lose. So what does Moses do? Well, like any good leader, he keeps his hands up. But eventually, as the battle rages on, Moses' arms get tired. He gets to where he can't hold them up anymore. So he sits down on a stone, and Aaron and Hur hold his hands up, and the Israelites win the battle. Today, I want to point out a few things that we see in this story that I believe can be an encouragement to those of us who are tired. The first thing is this. Moses wasn't doing anything difficult. Did you notice that? All Moses was doing was holding his hands up in the air. I need some help. Jay, can you give me a hand? Can you come up here? This is my son, Justin. Everybody give him a hand. Justin, I want you to stand right here. That's a good spot. And I just want you to... Hold your hands up in the air for me. Yeah, you can go a little lower if you want. You don't got to, I mean, you don't got to touch Jesus. Just, there you go. Are you good? You comfortable? You want to take your jacket off? Okay. I just need you to do that for me. Now, as long as Justin keeps his hands up, I think I'm probably going to do an all right job of preaching. If he starts to let them down, guys, there's no telling what could happen. Moses wasn't doing anything difficult. All he was doing was lifting his hands. He wasn't fighting the Amalekites. He wasn't out in the battle. He wasn't even lifting anything heavy. He was just standing there like Justin holding his hands up. Everyone do me a favor. Put your hands up. Put your hands up. Everybody in the house, put your hands up. All right, you can put them back down. Everybody looked like you were able to do that, weren't you? Was that difficult? No, that was easy. You see, Moses wasn't doing anything difficult, but sometimes even doing things that are easy 
can wear on us over time and can become difficult. Sometimes the things in life that seem simple can just pile up. I remember one time I worked with a girl. She was participating in an event in Dallas called the Three Day for a Cure. It was the Susan G. Komen Foundation putting it on. It was a fundraiser. You guys have heard of the Race for the Cure, right? Well, this was called the Three Day for a Cure. And what they did was they went down to Dallas. All the participants would get sponsors, and then they would go down to Dallas, and for three days they would walk 20 miles a day. Three days in a row over a weekend they would walk 20 miles a day. Now, I think that most of us could agree that walking is not a difficult thing to do. I do it really well. Pretty easy, right? Everyone who's here today, to the best of my knowledge, walked in this building. Would you agree that walking is an easy thing to do? But you would better believe that those last thousand steps of someone who had walked 20 miles a day, three days in a row, were really difficult to take. My coworker explained it to me like this. She said, you get to a point where just picking up one foot and putting it in front of the other takes everything you have inside of you. Church, it's the same way in life. Sometimes in life, it's not doing really difficult things that wears us down. It's just the constant barrage of things that are easy. Sometimes just getting up and living the next day. Sometimes just brushing your teeth. Sometimes just getting in the car and driving to work. Takes everything that you have inside of you it's not always cancer that gets you down sometimes it's just the fact that you have these back to back to back sinus infections and you can't seem to shake it it's not always divorce that destroys your life sometimes it's just the mere fact that it seems like every single interaction you have with your spouse is a negative one It's not always getting fired or losing all of your income or filing bankruptcy that destroys you. Sometimes it's just that constant stress of knowing that there's not enough money at the end of the month. Sometimes it's just the little things that wear us down and make us feel like we can't go on. Church, are you with me today? Sometimes, I don't know about you, but I'll pull in the driveway at home and I'll be like, you know what, I'm just going to sit here for a few minutes. I'm only 15 feet from the front door of my house, but I'm just going to rest. Moses wasn't doing anything difficult. You good? What are you doing? Stop that. (laughs) Put your hands up like they're, I could tell I wasn't doing a good job. I knew something was off. You just put your hands right there. Are you good? You're good. (laughs) Y'all tell me if he does something. Because I can't see him. He's behind me. All I knew is I wasn't preaching good. Moses wasn't doing anything difficult. He was just doing something simple for a really long time, and it became difficult. Justin, good news. We're on point number two. The second thing I wanted us to notice about this story is that what Moses was doing mattered. What Moses was doing mattered. When Moses was standing there with his hands up, I bet at one point he probably looked over at Aaron and said, man, this hurts. And if what he had been doing hadn't mattered, you know what I imagine Aaron would have said? Well, then stop it. Why keep doing it if it's hurting you and it's not important? 
Church, this is a cool point. You know why? Because it's a two-for-one. It's a two-for-one point. Sorry, Jay. See, this point tells us a couple of things. The first thing is this. If you're tired today, if you're at a place in life where all you want to do is just give up or cry, then evaluate what you're doing. If what you're doing has become difficult, is that difficult? Stop it. I was stretching. Is that that difficult? Yeah. Yeah. If what you're doing has become difficult and is having a negative effect on your life, stop doing it unless it matters. You see, this is why last week's message was so important. If you missed that, you can go to our website, centerpointnwa.com, and find it. But the reason last, stop it, Jay, the reason last week's message was so important is because in today's world, it's so easy for us to keep ourselves busy with things that don't really matter. Last week, I mentioned the Franklin Covey course that I had taken with the example with the rocks. I remember now that that course was called The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And that illustration was part of, was part of habit number three. Put first things first. And as part of that session, they explained the things that we do in life as residing in one of four quadrants. If you imagine that there are two axes, this one here is importance and this one here is urgency, then they identified those four quadrants. There are some things that they referred to as being important and urgent. Let me give you an example, a heart attack. Taking care of a heart attack is both important and urgent. And then they talked about things that are urgent but that are not important. That's when you get that text message from a friend that says, I have to tell you something. Call me back ASAP 911-911 smiley face. And you call them back and they say, girl, them shoes you were looking at at Dillard's are on sale for 30% off. That's urgent but not important. And then they talked about things that are important but not urgent. These are things like paying the mortgage payment. Church, it's important you pay your mortgage. But it should never be urgent. It should never sneak up on you because guess what? It happens the same time every month. And then they talked about how sometimes we spend our time on things that are unimportant and not urgent. These are things like making sure you harvest the crops on that game that you play on your phone where you're a farmer. Their goal in this communication was to get you to stop spending time on things that are unimportant. Church, some of you are killing yourself over what's not important. Let me tell you something. Your family does not have to have the newest sneakers on the market. Last year's sneakers will do just fine, especially when their primary purpose is sitting on the couch. Dinner does not have to always be a four-course meal. Sometimes, church, cereal's okay. And your house doesn't always have to be magazine ready. Because let me tell you something, the magazine's not coming. Stop killing yourself for things that are not important. The second part of this point is this. What Moses was doing was important. He was making a difference. Church, let me tell you something. No matter how much the enemy tries to tell you different, you are making a difference. Justin, you're making it. Stop it. Put your hands where they're supposed to be. Justin is making a difference when he listens. In your family, in your workplace, in your church, you are making a a difference. It would have been easy for people to look up at Moses on that hill and to think that what he was doing wasn't important. But they could not have been more wrong. 
what he was doing was vital to the mission. Does anyone here watch the Oscars? Now listen, they get a lot of stuff wrong. In fact, they get most stuff wrong. But they got this one right. You want to know what my favorite category in the Oscars is? Best actor in a supporting role or best actress in a supporting role. Both of those categories. It used to just be called best supporting actor. You see, the Oscars realize that it's not always the person who's leading the charge that makes something so amazing. It's not always the person that's leading it that makes a difference. Church, you may not be the one that's leading your organization at work. You may not be the one that's up here holding a microphone. But let me tell you something. You've got to have people that are supporting the leaders. What you are doing matters. So what Moses was doing wasn't difficult. It just became that way over time. And what Moses was doing mattered. The third thing that we see here is that Moses was willing to accept help. Too many leaders in Moses' situation would have lost the battle for the sake of pride. Because too many leaders are afraid to ask for help. And it's not just leaders either. Too many people are afraid to ask for help. Because they're scared that it makes them look weak. Church, nothing could be further from the truth. Can I tell you that we weren't meant to live this life alone? I saw something on Facebook the other day that I'd never thought of before, but when I saw it, it was so true. It said, in the entire account of creation, God only ever saw one thing and said that it wasn't good. God made light, and he saw that it was good. God made the land and the sea, and he saw that it was good. God made the plants and the vegetation, and he saw that it was good. He made the sun and the moon and the birds and the fish and all the animals, And he saw that it was good. The book of Genesis says, God saw all that he had made and that it was good. But there was one thing God saw. And he said, that's not good. Genesis 2.18 says, God looked at man and he said, it's not good for him to be alone. I will make a helper that is suitable for him. And that church, that moment, that revelation of God, that one thought is why we have women. And the whole church said, amen. The whole reason we have women and quite honestly, the reason that they are so different from men in so many ways is because God knew We needed help. If we didn't have help, we would mess it up. Church, asking for help is not a sign of weakness. It's a sign of strength. Let people help you. The Bible doesn't say this, but I can only imagine that at some point, Moses looked over at Aaron and her and said, guys, you're going to have to help me. I can't do this anymore. And maybe that's what you need to be man enough or woman enough to do today. To turn to your friends, your family, your church, and your God. And say, guys, You're going to have to help me. I can't do this anymore. Jay, do you need some help? Hunter, Will, can you come help Justin hold his arms up?
I love this story because it shows people helping people. Moses stands in the gap for the nation of Israel. He helps them. And when he gets tired, Aaron and her stand in the gap for Moses, helping him. But this story, excuse me, this story also shows our real source of help. Because church, let me tell you something. The Israelites weren't winning when Moses had his hands up because they saw him and they got excited. They were winning because when he had his hands up, he was a connection to God, and God was intervening on their behalf. A long, long time after this event took place, the nation of Israel was in captivity in Babylon, and they needed strength because their situation over time had worn on them. And they were tired and they felt like they couldn't go on. So the Lord, through the prophet Isaiah, sent them a message. I want us to read that message together in Isaiah chapter 40, beginning in verse 27. The Lord said, why do you complain, Jacob? Why do you say, Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord? My cause is disregarded by my God. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. God essentially says, nation of Israel, why do you think that I can't see you or for some reason can't help you? Don't you know that I'm God? Don't you know that I created the whole world? That I never get tired and that I understand more than you can imagine. Then verse 29 says about our Lord, He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Those of us who hope in the Lord will renew our strength. They will soar on wings like eagles, run and not grow weary, walk and not faint. Psalms 121 says, I lift my eyes up to where my help comes from. My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. And then Jesus speaking in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, says this, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Church, is anyone today tired guys you can go sit down earlier this week you may have seen a Facebook post that I made I'm a very analytical person I'm not very emotional and I compartmentalize things very well Sometimes that's a weakness. Friday evening, I was at home, and I was just overwhelmed with emotion. 
I was scared. I felt alone. And I felt sad. For no reason whatsoever. I talked to Christina and I told her, like, I don't, I don't even know why I'm feeling this way. Everything is great. And I told the Lord that and, and I felt like that he showed me or I began to see that it was just the little things building up over time that had become too much to carry on my own. And so I made a post on Facebook, and it was midnight. And I said, hey, anyone who happens to be up and sees this, I could use some prayer. I'm really struggling. And I don't know what all my friends were doing up at midnight. But within a half hour, there were 20 people praying for me. And I felt better. And I woke up the next day and, and guys, I think it got to where there were a hundred people praying for me. And I felt great yesterday. Today I want to give you that same opportunity. I'm going to ask everyone in the room to bow your head and close your eyes. Today if you're here and you say, Pastor, I am just tired. I need help. Some days I feel like I just can't make it any further. I need people to stand in the gap for me, to take me before the Lord, because I need his help. If that's you, I want you to lift up your hand right where you're at. Keep them up. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. At least eight hands have been raised. You can put them down. Guys, if that's you, here's what I want us to do. You know that we don't always do it this way, but today I feel like it's important. If that's you, you lifted your hand. I want you to stand and I want you to come to the front and I want you to find a place to kneel either on this front row or on this platform because I want to give people a chance to pray for you. Can you do that? Move. Move right now. 